Uh, welcome to my video on uh, GNSSIR. This is the video on how to estimate reflector height from GNSS data. So I'm going to use some of the concepts in the previous video. So I'm going to refer to reflector height, which is defined here, elevation angle. Uh, the satellite signal wavelength is lambda, and the surface type will also be discussed briefly. Um, so I'm assuming you've seen this a cartoon before where the reflected signal travels an additional distance shown in red and it interferes with the blue direct signal and that interference pattern is what we use in GNSS IR. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background so you understand where this is coming from. Uh, if signal reflections or multipath is a significant error source, why, why don't geodesists model it and remove it? And I think the problem is it's difficult. Uh, every site is different. We make a lot of assumptions on the behavior of other error sources that turn out to be pretty effective, but multipath truly is site specific. Um, second thing is that many geoscience problems can be solved without eliminating multipath reflections clearly. Uh, so if you can resolve the problem by averaging longer, there's less emphasis on trying to solve it. Uh, better antennas have helped, but I think people need to realize better antennas don't eliminate multipath, they just make the effects smaller. Um, and I also wanted to use this opportunity to call out some work done over the last several decades that I think really have motivated GNSSIR. So this is my attempt to give them some credit for that. Uh, I also want to point out that a lot of this was work done outside of geodetic geophysics type G GPS users, so they might not be as familiar with it. So first of all, we've known what the frequencies caused by multipath are for planar reflector for a long, long time. This is a paper I usually point to, 1988. Uh, you can very clearly say what the path delay, i.e. the extra di distance traveled by a reflected signal was known early on. And that causes a phase delay, which has a distinctive frequency, uh, which I've shown here as being twice the reflector height divided by the transmit signal wavelength times the cosine of the elevation angle times the derivative of the elevation angle. And you can certainly model that, but it's... Uh, rarely done. Now, uh, I take advantage of something Penny Axelrod pointed out, that we could get rid of that derivative term if we just switched variables from elevation angle to sine of elevation angle. Then you have a very simple multipath frequency. And why is simple useful? Well, simple equals fast, fast is good. That means I can use really standard periodogram techniques to estimate this um, term. And if I know what that term is, then I can get a handle on what the multipath uh, environment is. So how can we observe multipath? We have this, uh, we have an expression that describes what it is, uh, but how do you, what are the observations? Well, you have three choices. One is pseudo range data. It actually has a slightly different um, form of the equation, but uh, it's noisy. It is used in the navigation community, but um, it has its own complexities. It, it has uh, large errors, and it also depends on clocks and the atmosphere and things like that, orbits. Carrier phase data is the data we used earlier in my career to study the multipath problem. And Yes, it's used by all geodesists and surveyors and geophysicists, but it's complicated in terms of multipath modeling because there's no single observable that will give you just multipath. You're always faced with either uh, combining multiple satellites or you have other error sources there at the same time. Now, the third kind of observation created by a GPS or GNSS receiver is SNR data. And I think it's pretty fair to say it's used by no one because it doesn't tell you position. GPS and GNSS were developed to tell you position. Uh, signal strength is just something equipment computes, but it doesn't actually tell you what you want to know, except 
in this particular case, I'm going to take advantage of uh, what I call the beauty of power, signal power data, SNR data. It's very standard. It has a very simple uh, relationship over time. This happens to be a, at a site in the Western US with a standard geodetic antenna. The SNR profile is very smooth. Uh, at the rising and setting arcs, it's lower in uh, value than at, at zenith. But we don't see orbits. We don't see atmospheric delays. We don't see satellite clocks. And that's a real advantage. And uh, when you add a, two, a planar reflector, so a reflector that's two meters below the antenna, you see these very, very uh, distinctive uh, sinusoids, which are caused by those planar reflectors that we discussed in the first video. And they're not hidden by other error sources. Very straightforward to see. If we could get those frequencies, which we know from uh, theory what those should be, we could get the reflector height. And we know from Penny Axelrad's change of variables that there's a really fast way to estimate it. So the practical impact of both knowing what a planar reflector would produce in the data and this change of variable is that we have a very simple expression to model the data at least the SNR oscillations plus the direct signal. So that amplitude term I put on the left-hand side, A of E, uh, it's not a constant. So we have to think about that. Uh, but we know what lambda is. That's 19 centimeters for GPS L1 and 24.4 for GPS L2. And as long as you use sine of elevation angle, you can extract HR using a periodogram. So again, I've circled here. These are the data that are interesting. In this particular case, I'm showing them as a function of time. But when we do the periodogram, we'll use sine of elevation angle. And I use the same frequency to create these uh, model predictions. So they have the same, if I put those into a periodogram using sine of elevation angle, I get the same number. Uh, here's a case which would be appropriate for measuring tides, water levels, where HR is not the same for the rising and setting, for example. In this case, say three meters on the left-hand side and seven meters uh, on the right-hand side. And in these cases, there's absolutely no reason you have to use one HR value, you could cut this into smaller time increments and get a time varying tidal signal, which is probably what you would want to do and what we did in our paper on the Alaskan tides. And you also, there is an H doc correction, which we won't talk about here, but absolutely something to be taken into account. Now, the caveat is because SNR has this direct signal effect, which is just looks like a polynomial, you're not going to be able to look at really small h sub r values, small reflector heights, less than about two sigmas when you can't do it anymore. And since sigma, as I said, is 19 to 24 centimeters, 40, 50 centimeters, you shouldn't be trying to use this technique to estimate reflector heights below 50 centimeters, period. So to summarize, if you want to estimate the multipass frequency and h sub r, the reflector height, need to keep in mind that SNR data are not evenly sampled in sign of elevation space. FFTs require evenly spaced data. Uh, that is why we have been using what's called a Lomscargo periodogram to estimate the multipath frequency and reflector height. Uh, this allows any spacing. Uh, we can tell the Lomscargo periodogram how precise you want your estimate to be, but the reality is the more precision you request, the longer the code takes to run. And you're probably uh, pushing the technique beyond what it's really capable of doing. Is there a Nyquist for GNSSIR? Absolutely. And I'm going to point you toward this paper that I don't have time to discuss here. But certain GPS sampling rates will not work for certain setups. If you have a very tall antenna, it will not give you the correct frequency if you collect a data at 30 seconds. Um, are there other ways to estimate multipath frequency and reflector height? Yes, there are. And some of them are great and 
a lot of people have come up with ways of combining data sets and they've applied smoothing and other requirements and those are fine. This happens to be a very simple way to do it. And I would certainly be willing to add some of these other ways if, if the community would provide them to me in Python. Um, a big part of this is to make sure your estimate for the multipath frequency is significant. And I, rather than talk about that in a, a theoretical way, which is the point of this video, I'm going to talk about quality control with real data uh, on the video on how to run the code. If you have more questions about theoretical aspects of estimating reflector height and what planar reflectors look like in GPS and GNSS, I'm going to point you to Felipe Novinsky's uh, simulator that he developed several years ago. And the code is available both on the GPS toolbox and on his GitHub account. So I'm just going to stop there. And the next video will be about how to run the code.